الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا ربي زدني علما قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لإلاف قريش إلافهم رحلة الشتاء والصيف صدق الله العظيم The ayah that I have recited to you today comes from Surah Quraysh which we have spoken about probably a month or so ago that this is the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributed an entire surah by the name of this tribe however keeping the same surah in mind we would now like to look at another angle into the surah that's why I brought it over here again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah talks about the easiness provided to Quraysh which is the tribe of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of this easiness they were flourishing on a trade route now doing some research in this regard I noticed that in Arabian Peninsula everybody was involved in two kinds of trades either they were raising cattle and shepherding them like sheep and camel and stuff like that benefiting from whatever they will provide them with like the skin and the milk and the other things or if they were closer to the water sources like the city of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam medina which is yathrib older name or if you go up north to khaybar they were doing farming these were these were the only two trades available but if you look at the people of makka if you look at the farming capabilities is none because the water source is not there if you look at the cattle raising they do not have enough environment to sustain on that either so now they are looking at a different potential to flourish which is enter a market that doesn't really exist and even in today's time in modern economy you have to go into the market and you need to have some kind of a competitive advantage that's what we call it what are you doing that nobody else is doing like citibank in 80s came up with the idea of atm no bank had it apple came up with the idea of newton failed horribly in 1990s which was like ipod because it was way ahead of its times 10 years later on it was a success so now they're breaking into this market by building a trade route what was the need of the trade route because down in the south you have this flourishing kingdom of yemen up in the north you have this flourishing empire of byzantine and between them there is no communication there is no exchange of goods yemen has access to ports which allows them to send goods outside of yemen and byzantine empire has access to northern africa because all of those are christian kings and also they have access to the western hemisphere the western countries in the eastern side of the europe though so now they exploited they used this trade route to send caravans summer time up north because it's warmer and winter time down south because it's a little bit less cooler so they would trade goods they would buy goods because nothing grows in makkah they would buy goods from syria or the byzantine region and will bring them to makka and wait for a season and take them to yemen and sell them and through the yemen sport they will go elsewhere or will be consumed by the people of yemen they will buy goods from yemen that have come through the ports of yemen or are made in yemen and will take them after a season over up north in syria and sell them and like that they were making the business they had one basic principle of doing the business if my cost is a dollar i'll make a profit of a dollar so 200% that's basically how they were doing their business and that's how they were maintaining their livelihood now let's fast forward a few years and come at the time of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was a little boy he was a shepherd just like everybody else and he was taking people's 
sheep goats out, raising them during the day and bringing them back at evening time. When he was a little bit older, for older people, being a shepherd is not really a profession in Mecca. They rather become, if they could afford, a trade person. They become a businessman, coming from that kind of a family background. So Abu Talib approaches Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why don't you get involved in a business? Now I'm a poor man, I can't fund your business. I can't afford, barely afford my own family. Or whatever I gain, I spend on the people who come here for pilgrimage. Because the house of serving them is with our house. So now what I would like you to do rather is, take goods of a woman, a wealthy woman of Khadija, a wealthy woman of Mecca named Khadija, take her goods and sell them and make some profit out of it. And the amount of goods she sends in a single caravan supersedes all goods sent by everybody else. So she sends a lot of goods. She's very rich, very successful, very intelligent woman. The Prophet said, I will not going to approach her. Let's see. If she approaches us. And Abu Talib is like, what if this opportunity goes away? And the Prophet is like, no, we're going to wait. And somehow this conversation leaks out, reaches Khadija, and she's always looking for trustworthy people. Because sitting in Mecca and sending caravan, and then trusting the words of the business person that you're sending over to come back and report, this is 1400 years ago. So she's constantly looking for a trustworthy guy. So now here she comes the news, here's the news of the Prophet interested in taking up the job. And she's like, oh my God, I could never find courage to approach this individual. I knew he's the most trustworthy person and the most truthful person in the city of Mecca. So now she approaches him, will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the Prophet goes and meets with her, and they have an agreement. She says, because you are such a noble man, I will going to give you twice as much as I would give to other businessmen that do trade for me in Mecca. Because Khadija radiallahu anha would travel on two grounds, would, would do business on two grounds. Number one, it was either a salary based, that I'll pay you this much, you take my goods, sell them and bring them back. Even if you do a loss, you still get this much. Or, let's have a share in profit and loss. If you make profit, you get this percent, I keep this percent. And if there's a loss, I bear all the loss and you get no money. Those were the two principles on which she was doing business. So here, with him, she does a deal of, I'm going to give you this much amount. Now, that shows you that in the Makkan society, 1400 years ago, what are we witnessing? An empowerment of a woman in the Makkan society, where it's all led by men, and she's running a business as a very successful woman, so successful that every time she would send out caravans, she would invest a lot of money, a lot more than all the other investors. And she was flourishing. She was wise and she was intelligent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted such a woman in the life of the Prophet too. He wanted a woman that is wise, intelligent, composed, has a vision, has comfort. And she knows the ins and outs of the daily life. She's practical. And such a woman was picked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala well for his own prophet. Now that tells us a lot of things. Especially those individuals around the globe who think that the empowerment is equal to rebellion, which is not true. If that could have been the case, then prophet would have never empowered his wives. Come in the life of Medina, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, a woman who could read and write, a woman who was a scholar in the matters of religion, that companions would go after the demise of the Prophet and would ask her, what is the opinion of the Prophet on this matter? What have you seen him do on this subject matter? She was a debater. She was a poet. She would say poems and praise of the Prophet. 
And she said her famous thing that I'll translate for you was that the women of Egypt, they saw Joseph and they cut their hands. If they would have seen my beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would have slashed their hearts. Talking about the beauty of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she was a poet. She was a scholar. She was a debater. Among the wives, nobody could defeat her in the debates. And then Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha, another wife, Ummul Mu'mineen, these are the mothers of the believers that Allah is picking up as intelligent individuals, empowered. The Prophet Muhammad made sure that there was a woman in Medina that migrated from outside. Her name was Ashifa bint Abdullah. She was given this responsibility to teach Hafsa how to read and write. And she was her teacher. She was among the few women in Medina who could read and write. On top of that, whatever capacity people were intelligent enough in the city of Medina, she was a doctor of that time, doing some remedies based on certain things. So the Prophet asked Ashifa to teach Hafsa how to cure skin diseases. And according to the descriptions that we have gathered from the book, we have come to the consensus that she was mostly treating eczema. And think about it, there is no medical school she went to. And these are the kind of people the Prophet would want to be among the people that he would train. The Prophet would train this individual. And this individual grew potentially to an extent that during the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Umar, when he was the Khalifa, in the capital of the Islamic empire, he asked Ashifa to be the controller of the market, where the buying and the selling takes place in the capital of the empire, and she's the controller of the market, where she needs to see if goods are getting sold and bought in accordance with Islamic principles. And all the shopkeepers were instructed that if you do not know of the religious matter on anything, ask Shifa. She was the first person, first point of contact. And Shifa was asked by Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that you are not answerable to anybody but me. If you ever run into any problem, come to me. And if I don't have the solution, then I will bring the counsel of believers and will figure out some consensus. So much trust. So much trust was there and it was never looked down upon. And somehow, over the period of time, this craziness crept into the minds of people. They started equating progress with rebellion. Empowerment with rebellion. When progress and rebellion were never, never put together in that perspective. If that would have ever been the case, do you think the Muslim kings would have ever built observatories? Would have ever allowed scientists to be on the government payroll? Mathematicians? Physicians? Surgeons? Astronomy, mathematics, biology. Where do you think algebra comes from? It itself is an Arabic word. It was a writ- book written by Al Khawarzmi, a Persian guy, not an Arab guy. So they never differentiated oh, if you're a Persian, you cannot be a mathematician in the Arabian court. No. It's the knowledge. It is the knowledge that is important. We don't differentiate based on where you come from. We value the knowledge. He wrote a book, Al-Jabr wal-Muqabila. When this book and its knowledge reached the Europe, they called this whole branch Al-Jabra, which derived from this book that was written by Al-Khawarizmi. Then you have Bualisina, the Abyssina, and many others. But somehow, we lost the trail. And equally, there are women in the Muslim society, who have contributed to a lot of causes. The wife of Harun al-Rashid, Zubaydah, she noticed that when people are traveling to Mecca, they don't really have a good source of water. So she built a little canal system 
to go from the northern areas all the way to the Makkah so that people could travel by it and can reach the Makkah. And there is some flow of water in there. So she thought about it and she invested in this project out of her own money. Now we have witnessed again last week that for the first time in the U.S. history, two Muslim women made it to the Congress. And one, Rashida, she is what? A first generation American born of the parents who immigrated from a middle class family from Palestine, which is under occupation. But that didn't stop her from going forward. Another woman we see by the name of Alana Omar. Who is she? A Somalian. Born out of U.S. Immigrated here. She lost her mom when she was a child. But that did not stop her from progressing. She was raised by her grandmother, grandfather. But didn't stop her from progressing. She came solid. And she's what? She's in her 30s serving in U.S. Congress. So these are the people that are still out there. They're intelligent people among both genders that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, did not create one worse than the other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in the matters of religion, said that if a woman worships me and a man worships me, there is no difference in the reward system. If you have a right to go to a pilgrimage, she has a right to go to a pilgrimage. If you have a right to fast, she has a right to fast. If you have a right to pray, she has a right to pray. So where did we, overall, in general I'm talking about, came up with these crazy ideas that we witness in our little world that we call Islamic world? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given wisdom to us as individuals for us to think about that how moving forward we can shape and reshape the future generations. Because today's working class needs to decide when they retire, what kind of workforce do they want to leave behind. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم.